Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, great to be here. Thank you very much, Jim, for uh, uh, organizing and uh, for the team for the invitation. So I thought I would start my talk today with uh, a bit of a reflection on where we are in terms of the state of knowledge of the British flora. And I think that maybe we're approaching a new era of botanical enlightenment, which uh, may be an overstatement, but uh, we'll see. Um, so I think we're all very excited by the, the new atlas when it comes out. And that obviously follows on 20 years uh, from the last atlas with uh, new knowledge about the change in the flora and changing distributions. And of course, in that last 20 years, we've also had so much other exciting information like the hybrid flora and the alien flora and lots of exciting accounts for different groups. So I think the, the state of our understanding of the British flora is really unparalleled and it's, a, it's an exciting time to be a botanist in Britain and Ireland. So as well as this amazing uh, work on the, the British flora and looking at change and distributions, there's also of course been a huge revolution in our understanding of the genetics of the flora, which is what I'm here to talk about today. And uh, perhaps uh, less obvious to some here, but uh, if we go back 20 years, the first plant genome was published. That was everyone's favorite weedy species, Arabidopsis thaliana. Um, and that was a, a huge team effort and uh, slow and serial and really limited by the technology at the time. And then now we have, uh, for example, a new Arabidopsis genome just released recently. And there's only three gaps in the genome sequence. So th this genome describes the complete genome of and uh, all of the chromosomes in detail with just a few gaps. Personally, I'm not so excited by Arabidopsis. I'm sure some people might be, but uh, it's more the fact that we can now sequence the complete genome sequence of any plant species and learn so much about their ecology and evolution from the genome. So what has facilitated this and how has this happened? Well, I thought I'd include just one slide about fancy technologies, just because you might not often see and hear about them. I thought it's quite an interesting to see behind the scenes. So we now have pretty amazing technologies allowing us to sequence complete genomes. So up here, we've got the Illumina NovaSeq X, as they call it, which can sequence 24 human genomes a day. So that scale of sequencing is remarkable. Down here, we've got the Oxford Nanopore Technologies Smid Giant, which is this miniature device, can plug into the bottom of your phone and you can sequence DNA, long sequences of DNA in real time and watch them come up on the screen of your phone as you sequence them, which, I mean, that, that is the future and that's very exciting. Maybe we'll be using that in the field and helping us for identification. And then over here, um, this is on my Christmas list. If anyone has uh, 600,000 pounds to spare, Simon, no, um, 600,000 pounds, so this is, <laughs> this is the pack by Revio announced last week, and it can sequence near perfect DNA sequences that are extremely long. So this is the landscape we're in now, where we're no longer limited by the technology. We're, we're uh, driving forward and it's the collections which are really what we're needing to push because we can sequence genomes at scale. So my talk today, I wanted to highlight the Darwin Tree of Life project, um, which is uh, a large scale consortium project aimed at sequencing the complete genome, so a high quality sequence for every British and Irish multicellular organism. So we're doing all the plants, we're doing all the animals, all the fungi, anything we can get our hands on. The idea being that by having these genomes, we can then inform conservation and do more genetic analysis and learn so much fundamental biology, which I'll be telling you about today. And uh, this is a group project. A lot of the sequencing is done at the Wellcome Sanger Institute near Cambridge. Um, but just to highlight the key role of the RBG in, the, in this work. So Pete Hollingsworth, Michelle Hart, uh, Marcus Rusum, Laura Forrest, uh, David Bell. I'm sure these names are familiar to you or to many of you. A leader on the collections and uh, made a huge impact on collecting the plants. And the aim for us as, uh, as botanists is to sequence all the natives 
and the archaeophytes um, over the next 10 or so years. That's what we're aiming towards. That's that's the vision. So we're doing all the bryophytes and uh, a good uh, number of invasive species as well. So I think for me, the, the thing that's been most exciting so far is to organize the collections and see the collecting effort. And uh, this has been a huge, huge project. So we have to go out into the field and collect samples in the wild. And really importantly, to get high quality reference genomes, we have to freeze the samples there and then in liquid nitrogen and then transport them frozen all the way back to the lab before extracting DNA and doing the sequencing. Um, so we've been um, Ben Nevis and we've been visiting lots of exciting locations trying to get one specimen of every British native um, plant species. Where are we at? Well, we have our first genomes now, which are coming out. Um, the, the first one we're hoping will be the Burnham Oak, made famous in Macbeth, of course. And uh, it's a really stunning uh, tree specimen. Um, Max Brown, who's here, was uh, heavily involved in this work and leading on some of this, the, the genome. And I think it's a really exciting first genome. Of course, oaks are keystone species. They interact with a whole community of organisms. And this genome will really help us understand some of those interactions and some of the, the compounds it produces for signaling. We have around 100 other plant genomes which are complete and about 200 plant specimens, which have lots of data coming through. So making lots of progress towards our 10 year goal. But what I want to do today is really highlight what I think are some of the weird and wonderful genomes and the things we're, that we're learning. And I wanted to start with um, perhaps one of my favorites, of course, the mistletoe viscum album. Um, I took this photo in Cambridge. This tree is obviously dripping in parasitic mistletoe. And uh, the reason why this really stands out as an exciting exemplar is because it has the, the largest genome in Britain and Ireland of any organism. So the genome is 90 gigabases. It's 30 times the size of the human genome. So 30 times the size of the human genome, which is remarkable. And it's the type of genome that no one in their right mind would attempt to sequence until we, uh, we've given it a go. And this is work um, that's been led by Luthia, working with me. Um, of course, mistletoes are hemiparasitic plants, so they steal nutrients from their hosts. Um, and they have this huge genome size, around 90 gigabases. What's so interesting for me as an evolutionary biologist is they're actually diploids. So we tend to think of these really big genomes might be complex polyploids, um, but actually they're regular diploids. So it's just these huge chromosomes, which are many times the size of the human genome in themselves. We've sequenced a vast amount of um, data here. We generate huge amounts of data. I was trying to think of how to contextualize this and 10 terabases, it's about 10 um, laptops worth of data. But I thought a better way to compare this is that Darwin Tree of Life has also sequenced the first 100 insect genomes so that they're released and available. The amount of data for the mistletoe is the same as all of those 100 insects combined. So when you're having to weigh up which to sequence, do you sequence 100 insects or one mistletoe? Uh, of course, I thought the mistletoe, but uh, <laughs> uh, that's, that's a choice you have to make. But, uh, so it's a huge amount of data and it's the largest genome ever sequenced. Um, the, the quality of this is extremely good. So in this graph, you can see each of the, the sequences lined up on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, you've got the size of the, the sequences we have. And in red there, you can see the size of the human genome. So you can see that some of these uh, chromosome level sequences we have are three times the length of the human genome. So it's a, a really obese genome. And now we're trying to use this as a, to study why is it so big? What's driving that size? What we think has happened is that um, a lot of the sequences have become repeated and then expanded and degraded over time. And so we think it's sort of become obese over a long period of time. Maybe parasitism has some part to play in that. 
My second example of what we're actually doing with these data come from sort of broader surveys. So of course, having one genome is exciting, but it's only when you can start to compare and contrast between species, does this become really valuable. And Darwin Tree of Life is generating genomes across all of the community. So I wanted to highlight a project by Meng Lu, who's in the audience here today, who's a, a PhD student working with me. And she wants to ask the question, what are the general outcomes of natural hybridization? Um, so many of you all know that hybridization is very important in, in plants, it's very common, and it can cause the extinction of species or the generation of new species. Um, but at the moment, we tend to focus on individual case studies rather than think more broadly. So we don't necessarily ask how much hybridization is there in a particular habitat or sort of comparing between different species. So Mung was wanting to go through and pick lots of different species and then look at how much hybridization and introgression there is across different communities using these reference genomes as the foundation for that work. So she has been collecting a range of different species. And this work's been supported by a BSBI field grant, which is much appreciated. So she's been going out and collecting species which are, which have hybrids which are largely sterile, like some thistles and verbascum, um, some hybrids where uh, the, yeah, the hybrids are largely semi-fertile. Um, so you've got primulas and violas and then those which are highly fertile, so GM and Linaria. And here she's collecting the different species and then looking to estimate how much introgression there is between them. And of course, the British flora is the best flora to study hybridization because we know so much about it. So the, the hybrid flora, I'm looking over here, the hybrid flora is of course an outstanding resource. And here, uh, Mung was able to go out and collect different populations throughout the range and then do the sequencing to look at the amount of hybridization. Um, she doesn't have the results to show today, but she does have a poster here with her. So she's happy to talk more about this work and what we're learning. So as I come to the end of my talk, I wanted to maybe give a bit of future perspective of what I think we can learn from whole genome sequences. And uh, I think one of the first things I'd like to highlight is that I'm a natural history enthusiast, like I'm sure all of you are in the audience, and that sometimes you hear people talk about genomes and DNA in sort of a negative way, like it's drawing away from the things that we love and enjoy doing. But actually, I think we're asking the, exactly the same questions. So here we've got parasitic rhinanthus, and then of course we've heard already about carnivorous plants this morning in uh, bogland environments. The questions we want to ask here are, how many times have these types of traits evolved? Do they always evolve in the same way? Do different species do it in the same way? So here we can compare different parasitic plants, see if it's the same genes involved, see where they're stealing genes from their hosts. And I think that's sort of the natural history of the genome. Secondly, I of course couldn't give a talk without mentioning eyebrights, euphrasia, I'm sorry, it comes with the territory. Um, so of course, Chris is here, Chris Medrow and uh, Ding doing her PhD with me as well on the eyebrights. So we're, we're thinking, we're always thinking about species limits in eyebrights. And it's the thing that we get asked the most, are Euphrasia species real? Are, are they real species? Are they subspecies? Are they ecotypes? How do you know, is this one a, a species? Is this one a species? We get asked it every day. And it's been quite frustrating for me over the years that we haven't been able to answer it because the technology has been limiting. And that's the factor that if you take any random bit of DNA of an eyebright, it tends to be the same between different species because they're so closely related. It's only when you have the whole genome, can you start to look throughout the genome and say, what are the bits of the DNA that are distinct? So we're now actually able to answer where are the limits? What are the different species? And I think that's really exciting. Um, and the same logic applies to Sorbus and some of these other taxonomically complex groups, we can now address species limits. And then perhaps finally, um, here's Glencoe, obviously a stunning place to, to visit. It's always great to get into these sort of higher elevation environments. Um, I'm really interested in ecological processes. So what is it that forms the flora here, and we've heard so much about that already this morning. What is it that 
affects the diversity and distribution of plant species. And it may well be that there's been cryptic refugia or multiple colonization events or in situ persistence in some of these environments that we haven't picked up on. And once we have the genomes, we can start to address questions like, have those species experienced population expansion or have they contracted? What's been the genetic change over time? So we can learn a huge amount there. Um, th there's a lot of sort of challenges along the way. It's not always easy. Um, and I just want to highlight this here from example from David Bell. I am reliably told, because he knows his bryophytes, that there are two bryophyte genera here, Plagiochyla and Pleurozoia. They're growing intermixed at this, this particular site. And of course, to get high quality genome here, we have to be able to separate out these individual samples and make sure we know what we're sequencing. The, the biggest problem we have is an identification challenge and be able to separate out material. And so we really need to draw on expertise like at the RBG um, to make sure we're getting the right species and enough material for sequencing. So I think the biggest challenges now are the sampling rather than the sequencing. So I just want to end by thank you all the partners, particularly those at RBG. It's been a lot of fun and we're learning a huge amount. And yeah, thank you all very much for listening. Thank you.